Sanskrit and then the translation. Nobody has any other problem with English. I don't know if they can start English because they got. The verse sounds like this. Evan parampara praptum evan radir shayo viduru sakale meham atta yogo nashta parantapa. Translation This supreme science was thus received through the chain of the civic succession, and the saintly kings understood it in that way. But in due course of time, the succession was broken. <coughs> and therefore the science as it is appears to be lost. <coughs> oh, sorry. Prabhupada writes the following purport. It is clearly stated that the Gita was especially meant for the saintly kings because they were to execute its purpose in ruling over the citizens. Certainly Bhagavad Gita was never meant for the demonic persons who would dissipate its value for no one's benefit and would devise all types of interpretations according to personal whims. As soon as this, as the original purpose was scattered by the motives of the unscrupulous commentators, there arose the need to re-establish the civic succession. Five thousand years ago, <coughs> it was detected by the Lord Himself that the civic succession was broken and therefore he declared that the purpose of the Gita appeared to be lost. Exactly. In the same way, at the present moment also, there are so many editions of the Gita, especially in English, but almost all of them are not according to the authorized specific succession. <coughs> there are innumerable interpretations rendered by different mundane scholars, but almost all of them do not accept the Supreme Personality of God and Krishna, although they do make a good business on the words of Sri Krishna. This spirit is demonic because demons do not believe in God but simply enjoy the property of the Supreme. Since there is a great need of an edition of the Gita in English, as it is received by the Parampara, or the Sacred Succession, an attempt is made herewith to fulfill this great want. Bhagavad Gita, especially as it is, is a great boon to humanity, but if it is accepted, but if it is accepted as a treatise of philosophical speculations, it is simply a waste of time. So the verse again sounds like this: Ivan parampara praptum, imangraja rasyu midu sukali neha mahata dogo nashta parantapa. And again, the translation of the Supreme Science was thus received through the chain of the civic succession, and the same kings understood it in that way. But in those two course of time, the succession was broken, and therefore the science as it is appears to be lost. <coughs> so this is actually a quite important verse in the Bhagavad Gita. Um, because it deals with the way in which this uh, knowledge, which is in the Gita, and which is coming down through the uh, succession, how that is to be taken, <coughs> how that is to be understood, in which way does this knowledge let itself understand. There are, as Prabhupada says, there is no lack of of translations on the Gita. You can find many English and Danish probably also translations on the Gita. <coughs> There's one Danish, I think, by one man called Tuxen in the 1920s. And so many various English editions of the Gita. And I remember in, in a school that was back in the 70s or 80s, I we were also reading the Bhagavad Gita as a part of our religious education in school. Bhagavad Gita was not part of the Hindu part of our, you know, religious conscape. And uh, it didn't mean anything to me, you know, to read the Bhagavad Gita in that edition. It was a probably, you know, 
decent translations of the verses and so on and so forth, but because it is not coming down through the parampara system, because it is not, the knowledge is not uh, given by a bona fide acharya to the next disciple, so to speak, and, and therefore these editions of the Bhagavad Gita, which is not in the line of disciple-disciple successions, they have no spiritual power, even though we may find, find the same words here, but because the commentator is not uh, living with the knowledge and has not received that knowledge through the succession from his spiritual master, then that knowledge is dead. So if you read an edition of the Gita which is commented by some <clears throat> or translated by somebody who is not in the disciplic succession, even though the words may seem to be right, it will not carry the power. That is the, that is the uh, significance of, of a, a living branch of the disciplic succession. When you come in contact with a living branch of the disciplic succession, you will feel the spiritual life, and that is the proof of the pudding, so to speak, the taste. <laughs> the taste of the pudding is, uh, the proof of the pudding is in tasting it. So, uh, when you engage in this uh, spiritual activity as we do here, uh, like nine processes of devotional service, beginning with hearing, and then chanting, and then remembering. Uh, they have to be done according to... Um, they, they have to be done by having heard these things through parampara. The information, how to this, you know, perform devotional service is coming down through the parampara and it has to be unchanged. <clears throat> it is important that we also understand this. It is like a, a knowledge of Krishna consciousness is like a, a ripe mango, so to speak. And I've not been living very much in India, but I understand that if you want to pick a mango, some Indians here who can correct me if I'm wrong, you have to climb up if it's a high tree and then you have to pass the fruit down from person to person, otherwise it breaks. Is that true? That's how you do it? <laughs> I don't have any mango trees in my back. There's a coconut tree garden more. Pardon me? Coconut tree garden more. There's a coconut tree garden more. No, coconut. Yeah, yeah, coconut, but that doesn't break so easily. But a mango, I don't know, if you, if you have a mango in a high tree and you want to pick it, I guess you have to be careful because if it falls down, it breaks. No? No? He says no. But let's, 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 imagine, let's imagine there is a big, huge mango and you want to pick it. It's not mangoes, they don't break. They don't break. They can't, they can't uh, take it up after this. But what if they're overripe? Then they can break. No, they're not overripe. Oh. Okay. <laughs> I have to figure out some other example here. <laughs> I, think, uh, I think not to be taken uh, as a literal meaning. No. But, uh, it has to be a very logical meaning. Yeah, the meaning is, is that it's like a ripened fruit. And a, and a ripened fruit is a very delicate thing. So you have to give it that delicate to the next person. So this knowledge of this Bhagavad Gita is a very delicate thing and it's a very exact thing. And it has to be heard. And then uh, and heard as it is, and then spoken as it is, and given, uh, you know, you hear, and then you you give it further to the next disciple, so to speak. So that has to be done uh, properly. It has to be done in the way that the Prabhupada asks us to do it, and and, and the way that the parampara asks us to do it. That means before you receive this knowledge, you have to forget everything else. That is the way the Acharyas, they explain it. It's a very heavy thing, actually. Uh, you have to knock out everything that you thought you knew. Everything that you thought you knew about the world, about science, about the Big Bang, about the evolution theory, that has to go all out. And all our ideas about, you know, humanism and socialism and thisism and thatism, you have to, that has to be thrown out. Otherwise, it's impossible to hear. Because uh, listening to the purpo uh, to the message of the parampara, <clears throat> that can be done in two ways. Either in a, in a way of humility, you just listen and hear, okay, and, and you don't speculate. You just hear and hear and let the vibration go in. The other way to do it is to see if what Krishna says confirms what I think I already know. Uh, that doesn't work. 
that is not the way to do it. Um, uh, of course, you can do whatever you want, it's a free country, but uh, <clears throat> the way to do it is to be very uh, humble and submissive when receiving this knowledge. And as I said, not trying to see whether or not it fulfills the demands of modern globalized life. That is not, that is not how we should hear it. Uh, sometimes you can meet people who are guests in the temple and they ask you, so are you in keeping, are you like complying with the basic rights, human rights and all this? And that? No. We're not so much interested in these things. We're interested in the knowledge as it is. We're not interested in trying to please the socialists or the whateverists. We're not trying to please anyone. We're trying to please Krishna. And <clears throat> the knowledge coming down through the Parampara is what it is. It has been the same since time immemorial. And just because that nowadays everybody is under the impression that everything is evolving. And we have this idea that everything is evolving. We must follow the evolution, as they say. And I, I don't really buy that. We have to follow the development. You know, we have to follow the globalization. We have to follow, you know, how things develop. <laughs> that is, if you think that things are developing automatically, that is the idea coming from the Big Bang and Darwin and all that. That things are developing automatically by time, but they are not. The Vedic idea that is that things are degrading by time. Yeah? So you might you might say that yeah, but you know, so much development has taken place since you know, 1850 or whatever. Uh, but in the in the light in, in the light of the Bhagavad, to use an interesting phrase, in the light of the Bhagavad, this is not a development. It's actually a degradation of, of the human being. And we are becoming more and more dependent on material things. You know, human being, you know, in my life I've seen human beings becoming more and more and more dependent on material things. You see, nowadays everybody has to look on a square, on a four square inch black plastic piece with a, something going into your ears, and that's all that's going on. When they're bicycling, biking, you know, and driving their car, all they're ever doing is looking on their phone. They're not doing anything else the whole day. They go to sleep looking at their phone, they wake up looking at their phone. That's all that's going on in their life, looking at their mobile phone. So you can walk around, everybody's doing it all the time. This is not human life. This is complete. I don't know you like, you don't, I know you don't like me to say this, but this is complete insanity. It is total insanity. It's nothing to do with human life. And it's nothing to do with progress. And it's a very sad state of consciousness you find in, in the human society today. Very, very sad. Very misled. So, in order to understand this uh, Guru Parampara, the Bhagavad Gita, and the knowledge of Krishna consciousness, it is necessary to understand that this knowledge given by the Fawa nu verden, you know, that we are so proud of. It's not knowledge. It is a product of the material energy. You see? What we today call scientific knowledge is just a gift of Maya. It's a gift of the material energy to those who wanted to be in that kind of evolution. It is not that we have invented any knowledge or anything like that. It is actually God who has given this allowance for some time because those people who are under that impression of so-called advancement, they have a certain you know, type of karma to go through this because of their previous actions. But it's all just a gift of Maya. And if, if, it, if you want to understand the gift of Krishna consciousness, it has to be understood that this is different than the knowledge of Maya. It's something very, very different and it has to be understood in a very, very different way. It's not to be understood like you uh, understand a lecture in the university where you sit and you you know, yeah, that's good and that's interesting and yeah, that's right, I think so too. And, no, I don't agree to that. Um, that's also, as I say, that you can do that, but in that way you will not get the benefit 
of the knowledge of the Parampara. It can sound, you, you can call it this and that, and you know, indoctrination or whatever, but it's just, this is the technique that the, um, the Acharyas um, advise to listen very uh, humbly. And then when you take that knowledge in, in a humble way, and let it reach your soul, then it will act and you will feel something, you see. Nashta praeshu bhadreshu nitya bhagavata siva. If you uh, chant the Maha Mantra every day and you listen to the Bhagavatam every day, you read the Bhagavat or hear the pure devotee, that is very important to listen to the pure devotee, you listen to what Srila Prabhupada has to say, then something has to happen inside of you. Some, there has to be an effect. You have to feel some bliss, some <clears throat> freedom from the material world. Something has to happen. If that doesn't happen, and you still maintain the same the material consciousness, that's, that means the hearing process has not been applied in the right way. So Krishna consciousness starts with hearing, to hear the holy name, and also to hear the words of the pure devotee. And when that is done properly, and Prabhupada says that in the beginning, I think it's the fifth chapter or something, isn't that right, Oscar? He says that sometime within three days you can actually reach pure devotional service. Three days. But that is done by just by placing your faith in the sound of the Bhagavad. That's all you have to do. Nothing else. And so it's a question of if you're able to let the sound of the Bhagavatam and the Maha Mantra and the Bhagavad Gita enter into your heart in a pure way, then in three days pure Krishna consciousness can be yours. <laughs> That's amazing, isn't it? And Prabhupada says, there are two ways of doing it. Either you can go the slow way. That means uh, you, do, uh, you do austerities, you do yoga, jnana, karma, go through the slow process of going up to the net, reach at last yoga, samadhi, and then when you're in samadhi, you can choose devotional service or brahman or whatever. But then Prabhupada says, if you are, if you want, you can place your full faith in the words of Narad Muni and Vyasadev and the Parampara and then become Christian and just listen with that full faith to the words of the Bhagavad and you can become uh, pure Krishna conscious very quickly. And he says first you get uh, transcendental knowledge and then you get mystic powers <laughs> actually they see it, and then you get devotional service. It's a quite serious thing and that can be done by hearing the Bhagavad seriously for just a few days. Even by, by anyone. It doesn't matter who you are. A soul is a soul. A body doesn't matter. If you place your full faith in the sound of the Bhagavad and the Maha Mantra. Three days. So, <coughs> why doesn't it take three days for us? Prabhupada says, also in the Bhagavad, that it's because the technique of Shravana has not been properly applied. And that's why it's uh, necessary to, when you read the Gita and the Bhagavad, it's necessary to, to uh, uh, have the comments of the pure devotee. Srila Prabhupada. If you think of Srila Prabhupada's life and what he did and how much time he spent on his books, think of that, how much time and how much emphasis and how much, much many hours he actually spent on writing his books. So that should tell us something about how important it is to, to hear. Uh, chanting Hare Krishna is very extremely, it's a nice thing to do. We should do it all the time. But it's important to do it under the instruction of the pure devotee. That means while chanting our two hours every day, then we must also read basically the same amount of time in Prabhupada's purports, because otherwise we will forget exactly how to chant. You will start chanting with offense and we will start chanting without attention. That's why it's important to all the time listen to the pure devotee who reminds us, okay, this is how we should chant, this is, how, this is what Krishna is, this is what the material world is, and all these things. We need to be all the time reminded, otherwise we will forget. So it's important, it's a big responsibility actually to um, to join the Krishna Consciousness Movement, because when you join the Krishna Consciousness Movement, you are responsible for not changing the message. You see? That is, anybody 
who, who comes to the Krishna Consciousness Movement has this responsibility not to change the message. You see? There are only 12 persons who can uh, actually inaugurate religious principles or change anything or do anything. Called 12 Mahajans. Anybody knows who they are? 12 persons within the universe who are authorized to give religious principles. Anybody knows that list? Janaka, Bali. You said that, Bali? No, Pralad, Vyasaki, Bayasaki, that's Sukadeva Goswami. Bishma. Bishma is there also, yeah, that's right. So there are 12 authorities within the universe and they can inaugurate religious principles. Others cannot. So, um, <coughs> in order to satisfy the Parampara and the Mahajans, our business is to hear the message and then repeat it. Then it will grow inside of us. It's a very simple message. Krishna is God, we are His servants. The message in itself is not so complicated. But it has to be received with the heart, because then we can speak it with the heart, so that those who listen also can be touched. But, uh, so, being touched by the message of God is very simple. You just listen very humbly and then it will act. It's like a medicine. And as Prabhupada says, uh, uh, we have to accept Bhagavad Gita as a great boon to humanity, as a great gift from, from, from the Lord, and not as a, an interesting treatise to stir up some mental activities in our head, you know, something interesting for the intellect. Of course Bhagavad Gita is interesting for the intellect, especially the chapters about the three modes of material nat nature and such things are very interesting for the intellect. And, and you can speculate very much about it and, and, and maybe have opinions about it. But, but actually, uh, for this knowledge to actually wake, awaken it within you and, and, and have some life and some meaning, the listening process has to be there and has to be proper. Yeah, so, any questions? Yeah? You said that it is mentioned that we should uh, throw out everything in order to fully take the Krishna consciousness. That is a traditional everything. way. But that sounds very, like, uh, yeah. somewhat ir ir like everything you know, or like everything. Kind of what you know. That's the way to, to receive knowledge. That's what Prabhupada says, you have to forget everything. Just forget everything and this is... The, I mean, it sounds very... something that you don't do in the Western world. But we can't let the Western world define what we do. Just because the Western said, this is too much. This just smells like brainwashing. Ah, we like to wash our brain, it's been dirty for so many incarnations. So we like to wash it clean. This is our choice and we do it. They can't stop us. Yeah, but it's also in connection with another injunction that uh, renunciation means to use everything you have in Krishna's service. But how can you do that unless you know what Krishna consciousness is? So you start with listening and then you can do that. Because otherwise you will just use everything in Krishna's service but actually will use it for your own service. Because unless the, the, the heart is purified by hearing the pure devotee, and how can you know how to use everything in Krishna's service? You, not be able to. you can do all these things, but the first thing is you have to listen properly. And that means, basically, you have to listen to all Srila Prabhupada's books, and that's hard. But who says everything has to be so easy and simple? We have to put something into this if we want to become Krishna conscious. Some, you know, we have to put some demands on ourselves. We are human beings, we are responsible, we are grown-ups. We're not children, yes. After 10,000 years... Uh...